also a ranked ping pong player. So give it up for Alimo Mini. I'm going to give it over to you. That's it. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, everyone. Uh, I'm going to sit here, but when I play videos, I will remove myself so that people on this side see it also. So um, if it's not working, let me know. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Like Nate said, I have a fairly complex upbringing and academic history and work history. So I'll give you a 30 second intro about my um, work and affiliations now, and then I'll spend the rest of the morning talking about something totally different. Um, so ask me about everything else afterwards. Um, I work at Carnegie Mellon and I started a lab there called ArtFab. Uh, the focus of that lab is to make complicated creative workflows accessible to non-technical people and children. So imagine the act of storytelling, animation, virtual reality, complicated creative things. And I also work with my partner Aparna Wilder, who is over there in the back, on a startup called IRL Labs that's trying to be, bring these kinds of authoring tools for kids into the classroom. So please ask me about that also. Um, I will spend the rest of the morning talking about my curiosity about sound. Um, sound has actually been the medium that helped me bridge my initial investment in technology and science and all that stuff is really a euphemism for saying I had a Middle Eastern mother who wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> so in high school, college, I was deep in the whole pre-med thing and taking lots of science classes and all that and sound turned out to be this very technical intangible abstract thing that allowed me to talk about my passions about creative things and, and uh, the humanities and all of that still with the knowledge of math and physics and all the things that my mother valued. Um, I'm 42 now so my mother le cares less uh, about uh, how I spend my time but it still is a part of this trajectory that seems to keep coming back and as I go through the presentation today I'm going to speak a lot about insects uh, I'll speak uh, about the relationship that insects have with one another and with us through sound. And I'll end up somewhere that is a part of my work today that again has to do with sound. Uh, but these are not the typical kinds of sounds that we hear. Many of them are not in the audible human hearing range. And this is not an ideal sound listening environment. So this will be a lecture about sound without a lot of sound <laughs> for, for you to hear. Uh, but uh, I think that you'll um, take away what is the inspiration for me, which is sound is so special. Among our senses, sound is so uniquely pervasive and special. And I'll just give you a couple of metrics so that we know, um, so we kind of level the playing ground. So you go to the movie theater, you're watching the screen, the images are going by, usually around 24 frames per second in America, 30 frames per second in Europe, 60 frames per second if it's the Lord of the Rings, but you know, a few images per second. Now, as I speak to you, uh, the time resolution of your ears is in the thousands of uh, samples per second. So just tune into how, sens how different that sensitivity is. We kind of have time travel capabilities in our ears, you could say, the resolution of uh, time hearing that we have. The other one to think of is, um, you know, I sh and I'm an art teacher. Oh. Okay, let's stop everything and play some sound. Um, I'm an art teacher, so I'm often um, putting things in front of people, abstract things in front of people, and having them talk about it. Think about it, talk about it, talk out loud, critique it. What a total nightmare on the one hand. But on the other hand, uh, when you have a thing to look at, or a physical object, even that really abstract task of talking about it or theorizing about it, becomes so easily personalized and possible and social because we walk around things, we point at different parts of things, we liken it to things that we've seen before and if the other person doesn't know it, you just whip it out and show it to them. We don't have any of those leverages with sound. It's totally unclear whether what I hear is anything like what you hear because it's not even um, possible to confirm it with others because our language around sound is so abstract, right? If you think of things like consonant or dissonant or harmonious or happy or sad or it's pretty clear that these are very very culturally biased words to describe sad um, or happy whereas the color red you know there's a peak in our cognitive perception system around the wavelength of the color red and everybody pretty much has it 
right? So I'm tuned into sound because I think it allows us, and it turns out, insects, communicate uh, in ways that, are, uh, that I find so poetic. So the process today is going to be, I'm going to show you three pieces, uh, three art pieces that I made that are about sound and about insects. Uh, and each of them is motivated not only by the curiosity of how it is that this sound communication works, but also some sense of discovery, some kind of incredible discovery. And let's start with this one. So in, um, there's nothing to look at. Uh, in 2006, this lab in Glasgow, uh, Gabriella Gibson and Ian Russell, they made this incredible discovery about mosquitoes. So it turns out, behold, it turns out male and female mosquitoes, when they're flying around, they listen to each other, they match pitch, they match their wing flapping frequency so that they can fly in harmony and copulate midair and gain that tiny evolutionary advantage, if you happen to be into evolution, that is, like that whole thing. So there is this like deep musical sensitivity that actually has to do with perceived pitch, like ooh, as we perceive it. So we kind of link up there in our perception. And they happen to do it totally repeatedly. And this wonderful article with Gabriella Gibson actually described a methodology for how you can test this. So I'll describe it to you and then I'll show you a video. So the way that you would test it is you would get a mosquito. Um, you put the mosquito to sleep, which means you put it in an empty test tube and you submerge it in ice water and they become cold and sleepy. So if you have a lot of mosquitoes around, open some windows, it makes them sleepy. Um, after it's asleep, you turn it over, usually on a, like a cool pack or a bed of ice or something uh, cold so they stay asleep. And then quickly, you get a piece of wire, you get a small piece of beeswax, you put the beeswax at the end of the wire, you melt the beeswax, you spread the mosquito's wings, and you place the wire and the beeswax right in between the mosquito's back, and then you wait a few seconds for the beeswax to solidify, and then you have a tethered mosquito. You have a tethered mosquito that's alive, it wakes up as soon as it warms up, uh, and Beeswax turns out to be the ultimate uh, hypoallergic material. They, they don't mind having it on them at all. And what's beautiful is that that wire uh, conducts sound. So as the mosquito is flying around and buzzing, its entire body is vibrating, vibrating at its wing flapping frequency. And you can hold this piece of wire. And uh, now here's the amazing part. You can actually hold the mosquito next to your mouth and sing a tone to it. And it'll match that tone. They're that sensitive. The tone has to be kind of buzzy and mosquito-y. <laughs> <clears throat> and it has to be in their wing flapping frequency range, so 200 to 400 hertz or something like that. But it's a fact, and uh, it's a thing that's repeatable in and out of the lab. So a little bit of context. A lot of the pieces that I've done in the, in the art world have started this way with some kind of inspiration in science. And when you do this kind of thing, um, you have to get close to the scientists. So I was lucky to be at the University of Minnesota at this time, in the state of Minnesota, where the state bird is the mosquito. So there was a very strong entomology lab with thousands of mosquitoes, and deep skills and deep methodologies for facilitating even strange experiments like this. So we allied ourselves with them. Uh, we learned how to deal with mosquitoes. Lots of great anecdotes there about what happens if you inhale too many mosquitoes. One way to catch them is to just breathe in really fast. And it turns out you get more allergic to mosquitoes if you inhale a lot of them. Um, and then I'll also say, I'll preface this because what you'll see in the video is a lot of public interactions. Um, I guess I should say what we did. You probably know. We set up an installation of three living mosquitoes that are like a tunable choir of mosquitoes. So we tether them, and there's a computer system that has a loudspeaker that plays a fake female ghost sound for the tethered male mosquito. And then it matches pitch. We move the guide tone, and you can compose for these mosquitoes. And what you end up getting is a kind of music that has a lot of glissandi in it, right? A lot of ooh, because they're like all continuous changes which turns out to be a lot like the music of Drupad. And Drupad is this 2,000-year-old Indian tradition of song, often sung by brothers, because they have very similar voices. 
and often done in this style of shadowing pitches. So one person singing and the other one's um, playing. So let me play a little video so you have a visual sense of what this looked like. Some of the things that you saw um, so there are a few things the light bulb that's above each mosquito indicates how much it's singing uh, and then um, we try to leverage some of the basic inviting signs that you might use in an interactive installation to get people to interact with this thing so it's laid at around 40 centimeters off the ground which in Requ requires effort from people. So, so you have to actually like get low and get close to it and have that moment of discovery. And then we also leverage some other technical facts about mosquitoes, like the way that mosquitoes tend to find us is through our uh, CO2 uh, waste all around us. So the whole action of breathing on the mosquitoes tend to trigger, tends to trigger them to sing. Um, and then lots of other things, like you realize that mosquitoes um, need to have rest and they need to have moisture. So there is a mechanical mechanism that gently lowers the mosquitoes every few minutes so that they can put their legs on the ground. It also sh shows the, the viewers that this thing is alive and it needs rest and it moves on its own sometimes. So be careful in the way that you interact with it. And uh, I think what uh, might be nice to touch on now is just the whole range of strange anecdotes that surround the experience of showing this piece maybe 10, 15 times in five, six different countries. So needless to say, um, museums and galleries are not well equipped for dealing with pieces like this. So as a rule of thumb, this turned out to be a kind of thing that we could only do in Europe <laughs> because there they have more personnel and more money and they're a bit more forgiving about these kinds of adventures. Uh, the times when we tried it in the States, however, this is worth talking about right now because it's so important. Um, there is an element of this piece because it's sound too and you know, we scream and we cry and sound is so communicative and we are, I think, so prepared to interpret sonic expression from other animals or other insects as something emotional or something meaningful. 
So without exception, the few times that we showed it in the States, we had, we had people coming up and asking us about Jesus and whether we believe in Jesus and why it is that we're torturing animals and why it is that this is like allowed in this country. And you know, just as a perspective point, interesting to note that this never came up in any of these other countries with the exception of Scotland where everyone thought we were torturing animals and we couldn't figure it out because we'd just shown it in England and in France and no one cared and it turns out they don't have mosquitoes in Scotland, period. They have midges instead. So uh, these pieces that I show you, they've all turned out to also, in addition to this kind of Marvel circus of miniature miracle of life meets science meets media meets sound, they've also turned out to be these strange experimental social occasions where we expose our biases, where we basically tell people what we think of the world from what we impose onto this little creature that is, you know, quote unquote, doing its thing. Now, that's a quote that we got from Gabriella Gibson. At some point, uh, Gabriella Gibson, the author of the article, the initial founder of this phenomenon, so at some point it occurred to us, I think it was in Scotland, we need to have an answer for people that liken this to animal torture. Because sure enough, this device looks like a cyborg mosquito. And sure enough, it looks like it can't go anywhere. And the scientist had a really great simple sentence. She says, well, you know, the way that we do it in the lab is if we can perceive the animal to continue its usual cycles and its usual behaviors, then we don't consider it tethered or biased or you know, impeded in some way. So if it's still, for instance, performing this complex behavior of listening to another pitch and matching its pitch and flying along, then I don't think you're torturing it because it would stop doing its basic bodily functions. So this works with some success, as you can imagine, in audience members. But uh, I, I give that as an example of uh, how these pieces have quickly turned out to not really be about sound anymore, but about uh, empathy and how we empathize through sound and how we interpret um, vulnerability in ourselves and in insects. Uh, I'll give another example too of an anecdote that I think is very telling. So um, as a recovering contemporary artist, I'm proud to admit that I've rarely made any pieces that sell. <laughs> like people don't exactly come up and ask you how much this costs. But um, oddly, this is one of the only pieces that I have sold. Someone actually bought this piece, and I think the story here is worth telling. At some point after the opening of this uh, event, which was at Palais Tokyo in Paris, you know, they fancy uh, uppity place with lots of fancy people that spend money on art pieces like this. Um, the collector came up to us and he said, I'd like to acquire this piece. And we actually, not only did we not have a price, we didn't, we didn't have a plan. We didn't think it was for sale. We didn't even really know what he means when he said, I'd like to buy it. So I just asked, I said, Do you, would you like to buy a video of it? Or w would you like a few thousand mosquitoes? Like, <laughs> there are many options. We can rebrand it for you. <laughs> and he says, no, no, no. I want to buy the whole thing because I'm in love myself right now. And then in comes this, uh, this person, 30 years, his junior, that he's in love with. And uh, they actually proceeded to buy the piece without even knowing what is involved. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about what was involved. This museum invested God knows how many human hours in training museum attendants to perform that complicated task that I describe of putting the mosquito to sleep, tethering it, waking it up making sure it can fly. They did that for six months with thousands of mosquitoes from the Pasteur Institute. So the collector, he's a business-minded person. He was a real estate guy. He came to the back and he saw the line of trainees and the carcasses of mosquitoes. And he just looked at me and he said, we're not gonna be showing this anywhere else, are we? And, and my collaborator and I, Robin Meyer, we just looked at him and <laughs> we smiled. And he said, very well, uh, will you crate it? <laughs> like put it in a box so I can take it home? So we crated it and he purchased it. So again, the power of sound and communication to in this case actually instill this kind of value that translated to money value for a collector who mostly has gaudy portraits. We went to his house, it's all crazy, it's full of gaudy portraits. Um, and now this is sitting in his basement. And 
Henceforth, whenever we've shown this piece, um, it's kind of like the art world. We actually write to him a formal letter. We ask his permission to borrow the piece. He gladly sends it to us. He sends us this crate. We find a new laboratory, make some new mosquito friends, train a new army of mosquito attendees, and then show the piece again. Um, let's move on from this one at this point. Okay, so um, the next piece that I'd like to show is about ants. Um, now, this is going to be hard in a time constraint because the kinds of ants that we worked with, the leafcutter ants made famous by Pixar's ants and many other things, uh, they really deserve, I think, a whole year of creative mornings dedicated to them because their life patterns are, are really of mythical scale. And I have to give you a couple of examples just to root us in reality. Uh, they're one of the few superorganisms. I didn't make that up. That's a thing. Superorganisms uh, on our planet. Uh, they're the ones that uh, grow into the millions of individuals but function as one individual. That's what makes them a superorganism. So they have many different classes of morphology, like the same gene actually express themselves to look very different from a fighter ant to a big ant to a queen ant, all that stuff. And then my favorite anecdote, uh, and this is key for our piece actually, is that when you have an enormous colony of these ants, and you've seen them, they dig underground, they make cave structures that are the size of a town, right? Um, you can have a colony of up to a million, but there's one queen in the colony of a million. That one queen is like the sex organ of this giant individual. And this one queen lays one egg every 20 seconds for all of her life, and she lives to be 15 or 20. The same queen, that's about an inch long. So 15 years of laying that many eggs, and now here's the beautiful mythic part. Um, she gathers sperm infrequently uh, from specialized ants that she gives birth to that are male. So like most social insects, it's all sisters, you know, ants, termites, bees, all, it's all ladies. And this queen grows seven or eight males, and then she grows wings. Like think of Black Panther and ant, and like she grows wings. She flies out of the colony with the males on her back, gathers sperm, drops off the males <laughs> mid-flight, and comes back to the colony and lays eggs for six months, right? Now, what's beautiful about these ants is that um, they've been around for a long time. You know, they've been around on the planet for about 200 million years. So just to put that in scale, we've been around, we thought we've been around for about 5 million years, you know, Lucy and Africa and all that. Recently, there was a claim in southern Germany that they found a 10 million year human-like bone piece. So that's like an interesting twist, 200 million. So what that means is that they're very, very, very highly evolved, if you believe in that whole evolution thing. They're very evolved to the point of they actually have anti-parasitic material in their poop so they can scare away attackers to their colonies. And then I'll say the last bit that brings us right into the piece. Um, you know, they gather you know, leaves and things, they cut them up and bring them back. But the thing is, they don't eat those things. They're agricultural ants. So they bring those things back, mash them up, and they feed them to a farm of fungus that they grow in the colony, and they eat that, right? And they care for it like, a, you know, Grow Pittsburgh cares for our kale, right? So um, in the process, there is a tremendous amount of project management that has to happen. And they don't use Gantt charts, and they don't use Trello. Uh, they use pheromones, and they use sounds. So we know about pheromones, you know, you leave a trail and other people can sense it, but let me show you this crazy little video I found about the kinds of sounds that they make. Um, I'll jump to 30 seconds, it says here. Those sounds. As you might remember from movies like Ant-Man, ants usually communicate using chemical signals, like pheromones. But while that's a powerful way to convey important information, it's not the only way ants talk. Many ants chirp to each other by rubbing two hard parts of their abdomens together. Different species can use these scraping sounds for things like getting organized, communicating with mates, and calling for help. 
In fact, the Mediterranean ant species, Fedole polygula, has three kinds of calls. Workers, soldiers, and queens each make their own distinct sounds. Now, Fedole polygula okay. has a nemesis so named Possus fabiari. There is uh, your overview of sounds, and I have to show you one other inspiration also. So the process was that Robin and I made that piece with the mosquitoes. It was such a hit. It was uber impractical to do. You could never make any money or make a living. It was like, what a great idea. Let's do that again. Um, <laughs> So uh, we went into the world of sounds and what insects have sounds, and the ants turned out to be a part of that. But we wanted another thing, and we started to look around at social theory and economics, and we started to look at, in, in specific, the scholars that had studied these ants to learn something. And it turns out the way they find food and manage resources has been applied to search algorithms. It's been applied to predicting bankruptcies in the stock market. Um, but it took us actually all the way back to uh, Garrett Harding, 1956, published an article called The Tragedy of the Commons, which is about what happens in a society that doesn't value altruism, right? So there's a lot to say. This could be another year of a theme for, uh, for Creative Mornings. But the gist of it is we live in a town. It's me and Nate living in a town. And I have a cow, and he has a cow. And everything's cool because our cow eats from the commons, and it's all fair. But then Aperna moves to town, and she has five cows. And now it's not fair anymore, because the commons is being profited from by her disproportionately. So it starts to build this weird argument for actually privatizing the commons so that you can control it and make it fair. Right? So starting with that, we decided to resort to the absolute most altruistic creature on the planet, something that's a part of a superorganism, to see if you can set up a thought problem for it to solve hard tasks. So we learned from the laboratory and set up a thing that mimics their underground living situation, which is many different functionally specific spaces interconnected with tubes. And then we also set up an open foraging area that models the forest. So that's where like things go wild. And then you hear the sounds of mosquitoes chewing in the background. There are, micro there are microphones throughout the stage so that we're also picking up all those sounds. And then the, the gist of our piece is that we propose to them options that they have to choose from pairwise. So they have to choose from a pile of leaves that don't quite smell right because they have eucalyptus on them, or rose petals that look great but have no nutrition. And what you see is that very quickly these colonies optimize, as we've learned because we try to use their algorithms for search, um, optimize and find a solution. and. Um, uh, throughout the piece, you see signs of altruism everywhere, like ants martyring themselves so that other ants don't through some danger or some crack or some other place where you might get stuck. So the piece was made up of a kind of robotic moving stage with drawbridges that the ants would choose and adjust. And since there are 50,000 of them, things move really fast. So they eat a giant pile of leaves in about 20 minutes. And again, we use all the ploys that we learned from truce, which is things are low to the ground. You get very close to the insects. You can practically hear them or touch them. Sometimes people lean against the wall and open a crack, and the next morning there are 30,000 ants in the museum restaurant. <laughs> things can also go wrong. Um, OK. Um, so let's keep that one in mind. And then I will go to the next slide and introduce you to my third piece. So after that, again, it was so successful. You know, we made no money and bothered lots of museum attendants and, um, and killed a few thousand ants. We thought we should do that again. That, what a great idea. You could make a career out of this. Um, so we decided to go back to really the most formidable social insect, which are the honeybees. So again, the colonies of sisters. And here, our inspiration was really this wonderful thing. And who here has heard of this before? Great. So in 68, um, the Voyager was sent out, right? So this was this starship that I think just recently went out of signal range. But one of the things that went out with it was this thing called the Golden Record that was supposed to be a sound moment of all of our human history. So in like perfectly colonialist, imperialist ways, it was made of a record that had some Bach and Haydn and Beethoven and Ravi Shankar made it to the record, so that's good. But, um, and I can play some of these for you, but here's a really wonderful thing that's on there. 
There is a greeting from every head of state. The United Nations, an organization of 147 member states who represent almost all of the human inhabitants of the planet Earth, I send greetings on behalf of the people of our planet. We step out of our solar system into the universe seeking only peace and friendship to teach if we are called upon, to be taught if we are fortunate. So um, what's really incredible is that this really happened. There's a recording from the president of Burkina Faso making this awkward recording that says, I am the president of Burkina Faso. We are a small keychain-shaped country in the Horn of Africa. But you probably know that already, he says in the record. So um, in this piece, uh, we decided to actually try to engage in a more poetic sort of communication with a colony of bees uh, through this medium of the golden record, like this encapsulation of human history and sound. So we made what you might call an observation beehive. So it's like an open beehive that goes from the outside to the inside. And then the beehive was totally uh, geared out with sound technology. So there are loudspeakers inside the hive and microphones inside the hive. And Robin and I took the golden record and all of its compositions and recomposed it in bee-like sounds. As you hear, this is a Bach cantata right here <laughs> being played back. And we also played these greetings of the heads of state for them. And, you know, uh, a question comes up like, what, did anything happen? Did they do anything because of their record? And no, they didn't do anything because of their record. They're bees. <laughs> They're not listening to sounds that way, but the, the people that visited the, uh, the gallery certainly did something because of the record. All of a sudden, they started to tune in how sound is this thing that we've tried to use to communicate with extraterrestrials on an, on an international level. Like every president, I would love to hear Trump, so it would be so hilarious. I, I wonder what he would say. But every president actually recorded a short sentence, greeting and offering some piece of advice from the position of their country. Okay, Nate's telling me that I'm running out of time, so I will jump to my last uh, piece. Now, this one is uh, not an art piece. Oh, this, you gotta see this. Um, so, when you make these observation hives, it's not really clear whether the bees are gonna like it. This is like a reality, because you take a beehive, a traditional one, and you empty thousands of bees into this box, and then they might stay or they might not. It's really like that. And the only reason you know they like it is because this happens. So at some point, thousands of bees start spiraling around the entrance of this tube to signal to all the other bees out there that it's cool here. <laughs> Come on in. And then within a few minutes, about 5,000 bees came inside of this hive and then stayed there for months and months. So if you um, set up your own observation hive, don't miss this YouTube-worthy moment. All right, and I will jump to the last thing, and this, my plan is gonna fail here because I was gonna play you these sounds and you're not gonna hear anything, but let's just try to see if you hear anything. The question is whether you can tell what this sound is. Speaking of sound, okay, here, I'm back. Um, so these two are recordings of the sounds of my stomach. Um, we've been running a study with two colleagues at CMU, George Lowenstein and Max Giselle, on what you can tell about your mind from the sounds of your stomach. 
The recording on the left is the sounds of my stomach when I'm just sitting there, and the recording on the right is the sounds when I'm looking at some really disgusting videos that we found on YouTube. <laughs> and it turns out, through careful machine learning, AI-inspired analysis of audio, you can distinguish these sounds pretty accurately. So my uh, going away message for everyone is listen to your gut. The sounds in there tell, you tr tell us a tremendous amount about your mood, and I hope that in the next few years we're going to develop something that'll be like a gut bit, kind of like a Fitbit for your gut, that helps you assess your emotions your, and your mind-gut connection just through listening to the sounds of your gut. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, and we, I, was, I, was, I promised that we would be out of here by 10 because they have something else coming, but that gives us time for uh, two questions, three if they're fast, so we'll just turn it right back over to you for two to three quick questions. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the motivations from research that's already there in biofeedback, uh, basically about how we tend to be capable of controlling various functions in our body if we have feedback about it. And there's research that shows people can do that for their heart rate, for their blood pressure, for their breathing rate, as long as it's visualized for you or made sensible to you through th some other sense. So the the, the hope is that if we're able to somehow make you aware of your gut activity through visualizing the sound or resonifying the sound, you would gain control over it. Yeah. So the question is whether you can deter insects through sound. There are some products in the market that claim to do that for rats and mice and cockroaches. And as a part of our research for the mosquito piece, we actually bought every one of those and tried them, and none of them did anything. Yeah. <laughs> Mosquitoes tend to have very, very limited hearing capacity. It's actually just within that wing flapping range. So their sensitivities are more to CO2, which they see, and heat they're very, very sensitive to. So if you want to deter them, I think temperature and gases are probably a better way. The insects were our way in um, mostly because of just feasibility. It turns out, in a, I've been in the university racket, and in the university racket, it's a lot easier to work with things like insects. If you start to get into mammals and primates and stuff, you have to talk to very different people and Um, if you think of, uh, so here's a thing, um, we were looking at uh, who at CMU has fast frame rate cameras recently because we wanted to have extreme slow-mo. And we actually found a lab that on, on campus that has a camera that shoots at 150,000 frames per second, right? So just imagine that in your mind, what would it mean to have 150,000 frames per each second? And to me, that almost seems like a kind of time travel, because you're able to go into the nuance of time and change in a way that's so beyond our uh, actual sensing capacities. And what I'm suggesting here, it's obviously not like the theme of the next Back to the Future movie, but what I'm suggesting is that our time sensitivity in hearing is almost like a kind of superpower time travel because it's at you know, 44, 80, 90,000 samples per second, which is so different than touch or smell or sight. Thanks, Ali, and thank you all for coming, and we will see you all next week. 
Uh, if you don't mind, grab more coffee and food on your way out. And you can stay a little bit here in the back, but we just need to clear out this area. And also, thanks once again for the Glass Center for hosting us. Um, for those of you who've never seen glass being blown before, it's about to happen. It's very cool to watch.